Hello, everyone. My name is Anae Agostini. I'm CEO of CID Insurance Programs. I want to welcome you today to our Secrets to Writing Property Managers Like a Pro. This webinar is going to be uh, instructed by Mary Jane Law, who's uh, Assistant Vice President for USLI, and she's a specialist in, in property management. Uh, and then um, also we have Lexi Johnson, who's our professional CID's professional liability underwriter. And Jacob Cole is, of course, our marketing coordinator who does um, make, make things run so smoothly behind the scenes uh, for all of our web, webinars and marketing. So uh, let's get started. First is logistics, which is everyone should be used to. Uh, everyone's, all the participants will be defaulted. You'll be to mute. Um, you will be able to hear, but not speak. But your voice is important. So please pose those questions in the chat room at any time throughout the webinar. And then there'll be a short survey that will pop up after the webinar. And your feedback is really important to us uh, in, a, in a survey as well. So please fill that out. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Mary Jane to take over and teach. Thank you, Anae, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone, for your time. So some of our objectives today is going to be to understand the business opportunity, learn about the management exposures. We're going to connect the dots with some claims examples and how to best market the business. So for opportunity, there's over 300,000 property managers combination of residential and community association uh, companies in the United States. And more states are starting to say, hey, if you're going to be a property manager, you also need to have a broker on board. And the minute a broker is going to put his license in your facility, he's going to want you to have E&O. So things like this are just causing more E&O opportunities. Also with interest rates going up and a shortage of homes for sale, more people than ever are renting. In fact, 35% of American households are renting their homes. And as the market continues to grow, there's more real estate investors and property managers are getting into the industry and becoming landlords themselves. Also, housing discriminations are on the rise due to the ever-evolving definition of a disability and the confusion that emotional support animals pose. Most property managers and landlords are used to the seeing eye dog or the person in a wheelchair. And when they, when they have a vet come back that has an emotional disability and needs an emotional support animal, it's hard for them to wrap their minds around the need of an emotional support animal. But in 2019, there were over 30,000 fair housing complaints and 57% of them, or close to 17,000, were disability discrimination complaints. So you can see discrimination is a big exposure. Property management companies are exposed to litigation for their sole negligence, and they're named along with property owners connected to the premise of the property managed. Lawyers like to bring everyone into a claim. The property owner, the property manager, who it is, everyone wants to claim the, the property manager. So to understand the difference between a property manager's sole negligence versus premises related negligence allegations. And the litigation exposures are different based on the top type of properties managed, like single family homes or a condo association manager, vacation, mobile home parks, and then your commercial facilities like office retail, industrial, and self storage. Property management companies, it's the smartest thing to utilize a contract. I just lost the slide. I know. Uh, Hold on. Is it up, I mean, Jacob? Let me see if I can get back in it. I totally, I must have clicked something. 
and it went away. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be right back with you. I'll cover this, sec this slide for you while you're getting yourself back. Thank uh, you. So risk managing uh, the liability exposures. So most management companies, if you're, you're looking to insure management companies, most management companies should and do utilize a management contract that memorializes their terms of service. So they, that is their protection. Usually in that there's a, in that man management agreement, there's an indemnification clause in the favor of the management company um, because they're acting on, you know, at the direction of generally at the direction of the owner um, uh, of, of the property, uh, whether it's a community association, it's the board of directors they report to. Uh, it, when you get into more traditional property management, um, sometimes those get a little gray area uh, because the property manager is sometimes handling everything directly um, for the owner and making all the decisions. So it's hard to, you know, to have an indemnification clause uh, when you are, you know, you're you're the one doing all of making all of the decisions. So, um, but it, it normally there should be an indemnification clause, and that it works to the favor of the management company. Also, the agreement will typically include additional insured requirements for the owner's liability insurance. Uh, and so that, that's another key thing is that the property manager uh, management company will be additional insured on their, um, on, on their um, the uh, property's liability insurance. And that gives them another layer of protection. And A, unfortunately, it's told me I can only have one session running at a time, and it's not letting me back in. Okay, I hear you. Uh, um, okay. Um, MJ, maybe you, you have any try. I would say um, try to leave the session and then call back in. Try to rejoin as if you were just starting to join. So hang up and do everything all over again? Yeah, let's give that a shot. Okay, and I'll keep going for you. Okay, okay. sorry for the disruption, everyone, because this is really important stuff, and uh, I hate it when technical problems happen like this, um, but uh, uh, Mary Jane is at a, a different uh, location, and so she's um, dialing in on her laptop, and apparently there's, there's a technical problem. So, but I know this material really well, so uh, I'm, I'm going to continue for her so that you guys get some valuable information. Um, let's talk about important property uh, property management coverages, okay? Key for them uh, and uh, is that errors and emissions liability policy. And we're going to go into a little bit about each one of these so it makes sense. Uh, tenant discrimination, Mary Jane talked about a little bit earlier. Um, in in uh, on the first one of the first slides that basically said that a lot of the claims that are uh, a lot of the claims are be happening from that from from you know discrimination claims uh, because of the definition of uh, disabilities being expanded so much. So this is a coverage that property management companies should have if they're doing any kind of leasing. Uh, and then, of course, if they have employees, there's a lot of litigation in the employment practices liability arena. Uh, and then, of course, your general liability, making sure that your client understands the difference. We'll talk a little bit more about that between E&O and general liability. And I'm back. <laughs> Wonderful. Let me... I will... So sorry about that. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and there's a question, uh, Mary Jane, before you get started. Are you saying that the property manager needs to be added to the owner's insurance, or do you mean that they are included as an insured on the owner's insurance? Well, I can a answer that, or do you want mm -hmm. to answer that? We usually recommend that they be added as an AI on the owner's insurance. It's not something that's typically automatic. Yes, but usually when there's a management agreement and they have that language in there, they would that they would be out, they would be adding themselves to their client's liability premise policy. Yes. Okay. 
So for the for errors and omissions, the professional exposure, they have special skills, the knowledge, the training, their expertise um, are what it, are in jeopardy if they make an errors or an omission. And the professional service is a service performed by the insured, usually for a fee. A client always relies on the expertise of a professional, not just the property manager, but any type of uh, professional, whether it be a real estate agent or a consultant. And then due to this relationship, the client can suffer financial loss uh, as a result of an error that they made in their business. Not necessarily bodily injury or property damage, but a financial uh, loss. And if the client feels the financial loss should have or could have been avoided, they will allege sole negligence on the part of the property manager. And that's exactly what the errors and omissions part is going to cover. Other exposures that they have is they have a diminished value. They don't manage a property to their best ability and the owner can't get the rent that he used to. So he may sue them for diminished value. Of course, most of them have a wrongful eviction exposure. Uh, they do have to evict even if they follow the letter, the eviction process to the letter of the law. If someone alleges it, that's going to trigger coverage under the form. Failure to maintain. They have the administrative and financial errors, regulatory compliance, libel slander, and then some of them also, also dabble in real estate sales, so they would also have a real estate exposure. And some people manage their own personally owned property, so they would have an exposure too for the tenants from the tenants that they rent to. What types of claims do we typically see? The biggest one is an owner um, alleges mismanagement and lo loss of rent, which I had just explained, uh, is a diminished value for his financial loss. Or, again, a wrongful eviction against a tenant. Being evicted is a very emotional time, especially now with housing as sparse as it is, or we're so out of touch from a, a financial perspective. Uh, and again, even if they followed every letter of the law, uh, an allegation of wrongful eviction has to be defended. Again, we'll get back on the discrimination claims. These are more severe sometimes than claims of negligence. And some of these can cost up to 100,000 to defend. And there's also, aside from the ever-evolving definition of a valid service dog versus an emotional support animal. An emotional support animal does not fit the pet policy. So if a landlord says, oh, you can't have a pet here and it's an emotional support animal, that's going to result in a claim. But also HUD, Housing of Urban Development, they actually put testers out into the marketplace, and sometimes they tune, they uh, uh, fund nonprofits to the tune of like $20 million to actually go out and test, put testers into rental offices to see how they're handling the same requests, but they're asked by someone who is or is not a protected class. And again, emotional support animals, let's, we all have heard how people were trying to get all kinds of animals on planes a couple of years ago. Emotional support animals were all over the place. Well, they don't only have to be a dog. They could, they could be a guinea pig, a cat, a rabbit, any type of an emotional support animal. And again, you cannot cite a pet policy um, if it's an emotional support animal. Another way we're starting to see some claims are from residents at homeowner associations who were denied uh, a handicap spot or one that wasn't close enough to their home, and they were given citations for not parking correctly, and they allege discrimination based on a handicap disability, and we're starting to see more and more of them in homeowner associations as well.
a property management company is more likely to be sued by an employee but than one of their clients. This is if they purchase employment practices liability. So they do have a lot of EPL exposures if they have a lot of employees. And another problem is some employees work at the properties and not always under the eye of the property manager. So they don't have always have 100% control over their employees. So their exposures are the federal laws, the state laws, and again, uh, discrimination, harassment, retaliation. So the most typical EPL claims that we see is not being paid overtime for work done past normal business hours, Fair Labor Standard Act. Uh, allegations of discrimination due to race, and then uh, allegations of retaliation due to personal differences. They're the three biggest claims that we see. So general liability, there's two types of general liability. That's gonna cover them for bodily injury and property damage as a result of an organization's operations. Some of the important things to consider is they also have an office premise exposure. This is a designated premises only, and that would cover the slip and fall at the office location if a tenant came in to make a payment and tripped over a cord, if you would wanna have coverage for your office. Also, some landlords mandate that if you have an office in my building, you must carry premises GL for your office. Then you have the comprehensive general liability, which extends to the properties that are managed. And it's going to cover them in the event someone blames the property manager for an injury or property damage done at one of the managed properties. With that, you can also get hired a non-owned auto, and uh, it'll cover the maintenance that, because a lot of property managers do maintenance at their properties, so it would cover for that as well. Now, the, gen the comprehensive general liability is a lot more expensive than the office premises only. So again, I kind of reiterated what kind of claims examples we see, but someone injures themselves while they're in a property manager's office, uh, they can sue for bodily injury. And then the bigger exposures are for claims that are done at the uh, properties that are managed. The steps were dark and not safe, or a pavement was uneven, a sink pipe broke, leaked, ruining the floor. These are all the type of comprehensive general liability claims that you see. So you can see the exposure for commercial general liability is very great. Therefore, the premiums for CGL are a lot higher as well. And not every property manager has that exposure because some of them are indemnified by their, they have a hold harmless and indemnification clause with the associations. So the association will usually uh, help them in the event of a claim like this. Okay, Mary Jane, thank you so much. That that information was so great. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna finish up the webinar and, and talk about a few other coverages. Um, I just wanted to also uh, point out relative to that general liability coverage. That is one of the trickier ones uh, within. Um, uh, the property management insurance exposures or, uh, or risk exposures, if you want to uh, call it that. Because um, MJ did point out it's usually community association management companies that have really strong management that actually, uh, that actually end up having strong indemnification and additional insured uh, uh, agreements within that management contract. Uh, that make it easier for them to be indemnified, you know, if if there's a if there's a loss. And what what are we talking about? We're talking about bodily injury or property damage. And um, and that's if you 
that extended coverage, as she said, is much more expensive. So you have to have that conversation with your client. If they're in traditional property management um, and they're doing single family homes and apartments, ch the chances are they're going to need that more expensive GL because they're making more decisions and they won't easily be able to write on the coattail of the owner. But you know, I would definitely recommend that they get themselves additional insured and at the time of a loss, if it's not really sole negligence, that they are able to use the owner's premise liability policy at the time of an, an allegation that might be made against both the owner and the property management company, if that makes sense. Um, before I uh, go on to the other coverages, there was a question, and Lexi, I just wanted to see if you could answer this for me. Um, will, you, uh, can, will you underwrite property management companies that also have short-term rental operations? Yes, so we do have carriers um, that will write the property management companies with a short-term rental operation. Uh, we just need our property management application completed and sent in, but we can consider. Perfect, great, but glad that was a yes answer. <laughs> um, so let's look at, let's talk about some of the other ones. The, 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 the biggies we've covered are the ones you need to spend the most time on, uh, but property becomes property becomes an, an important one um, also because all of these management companies will have um, at least one location and uh, and um, usually there'll be multiple locations and so obviously they need to uh, ensure that property within um, with, within their offices and that's that's going to be important there was a question that had come in prior to the, the webinar in reference, uh, and I, I, I think there might have been, um, it was a question related to, uh, I, I, uh, okay, Jacob, you probably have, are gonna have to remind me, it was basic, broad form, and special form, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah, you got it. Right, so uh, in the, when it comes to property, you wanna always be asked, you always wanna ask for, and you can get, a special form uh, because it's going to give you the maximum amount of perils that can be covered uh, under the property section. Uh, and so special form is the one you would want to choose when it comes to property. Uh, so it, in addition, um, if you're, especially if you, excess an umbrella becomes important, becomes the most important if you have an off-premise general liability policy because that's where I would recommend uh, pushing for additional, you know, million-dollar limits of uh, uh, umbrella coverage to go over that off-premise GL. When it's the premise policy uh, and it's only for their office, there's far less exposure of a really high limit, uh, you know, uh, uh, loss taking place. So just keeping those two things uh, separate is a good idea. Um, and uh, the other question was, uh, does CID offer comprehensive GL? And yes, we have uh, numerous markets that can we can write that coverage with and that can give a competitive premium. It's more expensive, it's, you know, that, that's the truth. And it's tight, the GL market is tightened up because there's been a lot of claims. Uh, so j you just need to be aware of that. And Lexi can certainly help any of you that would like to um, um, to, to have a conversation about that or um, would like to submit for quotes. Um, an, another question, I've noticed many GL policies have, have habitational, habitability uh, exclusion, have, have a habitational exclusion. Do you have any markets that do not include such exclusions? Um, I know for a fact I can answer that even though I can turn that over to Lexi, but yes, we do have markets that will definitely um, uh, uh, not have those exclusions on it. Uh, and uh, next question, would tenant discrimination be included as third-party coverage on an EPL policy? Um, it can be, it can be. That would be, it's, it's basically would be part of the third party and that's a, that's when um, an employee of a company, I'm just gonna explain it, um, because an EPL policy is designed for the the um, 
employees of the company um, and, and the employer potentially, you know, um, harass, harassing or discriminating against them. Uh, in, in, in third party coverage, which is, is very similar to discrimination or tenant discrimination coverage, um, definitely is designed to protect if an employee of a company harasses or discriminates against someone else that is not part of the company, not a, 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 a third party, basically, okay? And uh, though I like the idea, you would have to look because I think, uh, you know, the third party uh, the, or the tenant discrimination may have bro uh, more broad coverage and I would probably have to uh, ask Mary Jane to answer that portion of the question. Is this one about the AI on the building owner? Uh, no, it's the uh, would 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 a, a tenant discrimination standalone discri discri discrimination coverage be uh, included or or be broader than uh, the third party coverage that would be added onto an EPL policy? It, it's a different exposure. How we handle it here at USLI is we can give you standalone EPL coverage that will give you true third party, but it will not give you tenant discrimination coverage. Therefore, if you want a comprehensive coverage, you would need to purchase the E&O, the tenant discrimination, and then the EPL, and then you would be fully covered for full third party coverage as well as discrimination. Perfect. That's a great that's 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 what that perfect answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have another question. As a multifamily owner myself, I would like for my property manager name to to name me the building owner as the AI for issues resulting from discrimination or E and O. Is that something CIDs markets will do, or is the building owner part of the definition um, of an insured? Um, like building owners' policies include the PM as an insured. Mary Jane, would you sure I can? Answer? Sure, absolutely. As a as a property owner who who contracts with the property manager, uh, we give automatic additional insured status in the form for anyone the property manager has agreed to render professional services for. So you would have automatic AI status in the form. We would never write a, a property owner as a named insured because you're not really rendering any services, but we would protect you as an AI for any vicarious liability that if you got pulled into a claim as a result of something your property manager did. Is that also true for the tenant discrimination, Mary Jane? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. So let's let's keep going. Um, cyber liability is also an imp very important for property management companies because they store a lot of private information of the clients. Also, they're exposed to ransomware uh, attacks, which are the most you know the biggest thing uh, today. So. Um, Definitely have that discussion with him. We have lots of markets for cyber liability. Fidelity, because they they usually are managing the money, the funds um, of all of these uh, different properties that they're, they're overseeing, um, then a Fidelity becomes a really important uh, coverage. Um, definitely a limit for employee theft and um, definitely consider a computer fraud and funds transfer, um, uh, which that, that coverage is important to purchase on the Fidelity because you can't always get it on the cyber liability policy. And last but not least is workers' comp. Um, most of these management companies have employees, um, and it's really important to, t to take a very careful look at what each of the employees is doing so that you classify those employees correctly and to get the most competitive premium. We, we, we write a lot of workers' comp for um, property management companies and um, would be glad to assist uh, with that kind of uh, employee classification. And let's continue. So uh, last, we're gonna close with the last thing here. Um, property managers are a great, what I call a point of sale. They're, when you write the management company, you become the expert in insurance, and then you have that ability to cross sell all of the properties that they manage. 
um, and re you know potentially go get through the files and review the insurance for all of these properties and then get the opportunity to quote it uh, uh, and and potentially become you know the broker or agent um, for those those properties. So this is a great opportunity. There's also personal lines if they're doing single you know they're managing single family homes um, and so. Uh, uh, you just want to offer to do a, a review of each uh, client's insurance and create an exploration list that, uh, as they all come up, you you, uh, you you propose insurance for them for each of us. Uh, do we have another question? Turn this. Okay. So the definition of the third party in an EPL policy does not include tenants. Is that correct, Mary Jane? Well, it's not here with USLI. It doesn't include tenants because the intent behind an employment practice is, is to give them coverage for their employees. And third-party coverage in the event, let's say a UPS driver goes into an office and one of the women in there whistle at him or something like that and he feels like he was sex harassed. We would want to be able to give coverage for that UPS driver due to the employee doing that to him, but the intent is not really to cover tenants. Tenants pose a whole different exposure, but that is why we can endorse third party on our standalone EPL, and then you can purchase tenant discrimination so that you have comprehensive coverage. Excellent, that's, that's, a, that's a perfect answer. Um, for HOAs, does the DNO policy cover discrimination Claims uh, can the failure to mean uh, failure to properly ensure exclusion be removed from the DNO policy. Um, well, now we're talking um, now we're talking insuring a uh, HOA, which uh, our subject so far has been talking about uh, property management companies and how to insure them. Um, but uh, that but the, the fire line that you would want to use the lifeline for the management company. Would be when if they're they're managing HOAs, then they they would want to be able to use to add themselves to the policy or be named. You know, the, uh, the real estate management company would be named in as a named insured within the policy language. Um, and you can there is third party coverage on a, a lot of broad form DNO policies and that will cover discrimination claims. Uh, and that is. But that would be for the association's policy, and um, and we do do write that coverage. Um, but I just wanted to make sure, and so that would include if the management company was uh, insured on that policy as well, then they um, they would be covered as well. In, in and they would be the management company could be firewalled, and the association policy could pick it up. Uh, can the failure to in properly ensure exclusion be removed from the DNO policy, I'm not sure I could answer that question um, uh, because it varies by each uh, carrier. And um, and Lexi does Lexi is our professional underwriter and um, is for everything for um, for profit. Uh, and uh, we Michelle uh, Belden is our uh, nonprofit under underwriter, so she's not with us today. So, um, but if you wanted to. Um, we could answer that later. We could forward it over to Michelle to get that answer for you. Uh, so last but not least, I just want to thank you all for joining us today. And um, we, Lexi is, is ready and, and able to answer questions for you, quote, management companies, and quote, any type of professional. Uh, so, She's um, very good at what she does, and you'll enjoy working with her a lot. Um, make sure you visit our website at cidinsurance.com. We have lots of tools there for you. Um, and, um, and then um, take our survey at the end of the webinar because we want your feedback and we want your ideas. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh.